Hi, I'm Margo from Movie Maker Magazine, and I'm about to speak with Katie Azelton about her new movie, Mac and Rita, out August 12th. Thank you so much for joining us today, Katie, and I really enjoyed Mac and Rita. It was a beautiful movie. Um, oh, so, thank you so thank much. You. I really loved making this movie. Yeah, so we'll just dive right in. How did you end up directing Mac and Rita? Like, what was your journey? Um. <laughs> Well, it's kind of a, it's the funniest way I've ever gotten a job for. Um, but I played Diane Keaton's daughter in the movie Book Club. And that movie was direct, uh, was produced by Alex Sachs, who I have been friendly with for years um, since she worked at ICM, which is my old agency. And, and so we've had always been friendly, got to be much better friends on Book Club ended up going to the same Pilates studio, which is the same Pilates studio that you see in the movie, which is not an accident. Uh, and one day she just said, you know, Katie, are you ever going to direct again? Cause it, I had taken a beat and, um, and I was like, yeah, no, I really am thinking this is my year. And she goes, great. I have a script for you. And it was this, and I read it and I was like, I don't know, babe, like this is, a big broad body switching comedy and I make really small like gritty little indie movies for no money that are just about feelings and uh and she was like all right well like let's be straight here like it's still not going to be a lot of money <laughs> and it's ultimately a movie about feelings that just happens to have some body switching elements to it uh but it also has Diane Keaton and like are you going to say no to that and uh and I, I wasn't. <laughs> that's incredible Re yeah that's so great um what were your first thoughts when you read the script um I mean look my first thoughts were I had trepidation about a big broad comedy it was it felt like it was out of my wheelhouse and um even though the more I thought about it I was like I my comfort actually is in comedy after being on the league for so long and um, I was thinking about like my happier experiences on set and most of them are on comedies and uh, you know even like thinking back to the freebie where like my favorite moments were like doing our happy montages and it's like maybe you should just make an entire movie that is a big happy montage right um, and so but then I really the message of this movie and the heart of this movie really resonated with me and I think um, it felt uh, particularly like post pandemic, mid pandemic, like when we really get the ball rolling with this, it felt like a really important message to get out there and share. Yeah. For those watching that don't know what the movie is about, can you give us like a little breakdown and, and kind of what that um, message yeah. is? Yeah, no, the, the movie is about a 30 year old woman who feels stuck and uh, in her life living kind of inauthentically and trying to fit in with friends who are sort of running at a different pace that she, than she prefers to. And, um, you know, I think she really like confuses age with wisdom and she longs to have that sense of self that the older women in her life have. And, um, by a crazy turn of events, she, uh, Tr just transforms into a 70 year old version of herself who then is still on the journey um, to realize that it is, uh, you know, there is no age to living your, your truest self. Like you just have to love who you are, where you're at. Yeah. And I, I'm speaking of that, that tanning, the magic tanning bed. Um, how did you get Simon Rex involved in this movie? Because that was such a pleasant surprise. Like, I know it was really fortuitous the way it worked out. So Alex um, Sachs also produced Red Rocket. And as we were looking to cast this role and sort of really thinking about who this was going to be, um, she was like, we just picture locked. And she goes, I really think Simon is going to have a year. And I was like, Simon Rex, like MTV, Simon Rex, Jack and Jill's. Simon Rex. And she's like, yeah, no, he's kind of incredible. And so I met with him and he really is, he kind of has like that Luca vibe. Like he lives out in the desert in like a storage container. <laughs> that is real. <laughs> that is real. That is not written for the character. Like he is that, that character. So it felt 
once I met him, I was like, oh, he's perfect. And he's great. And and truthfully, like he's a real special dude. I was really happy to meet him on this. Yeah. And I'm also so curious as an actress yourself, like how does that so much acting experience, does that influence how you direct? Um, Definitely. You know, I think there are a lot of directors who are very technical in the cinema of what they do. And the way I approach uh, directing is more of like, I hire a DP I love, we set the look, and then I actually just let him do it, them do their job. This time it was a him, it was Sean McAway, who I loved working with, but it really is like, you know, setting the 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 look of the movie early and then working on shots, obviously, as we go, but setting everything on the technical side. So I, on the day, can like get in with the actors and and that's like, that's my happy place. Like, I really love getting in there and like working on performance and finding those moments that are really great and playing. Like, it just feels also playful. Yeah, this movie was so fun and and to your point, playful. It reminded me of Freaky Friday a little bit. Like, yeah, definitely. There were nods to like Freaky Friday and 13 going on 30 and big and, um, it's interesting, like, you know, the body swapping device of storytelling is is so useful as a tool of of sort of teaching a lesson. And it's a great way of being able to show perspective. And uh, it's uh, yeah, after doing it, I was like, oh, yeah, no, it's incredibly handy as a storyteller. Yeah. And Diane Keaton is so brilliant in this role, like what was it like working with her? What conversations did you have about this character and kind of like what this movie means? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, an utterly surreal experience. I think, you know, when I got cast in book club as her daughter, I was like, I'm done. Like I just retire after this, right? Like, it does is it ever, like, could any dream come any truer? Like I, I that was it. And I'm glad I didn't because it turns out it can come truer (laughs) and it did. So I really like, even like on the eve of this coming out in theaters, like I'm still pinching myself that I got that opportunity because she is just quintessentially like the most Diane Keaton you could ever, ever hope for. Like the Diane Keaton that we all know and have fallen in love with as audiences is exactly who she is, which is so great because for this movie that's it right like it's all about showing your your most true self your most authentic self and she just really epitomizes that like she is unapologetically 100% herself and that is with all of the quirks and the flaws and the insecurities and the heart like that all wrapped up into one is Diane so then working with that was really just like allowing those natural things to shine, but that is just what she does. It's what she does in every performance. She is just 100% present and there. And um, I think that's why she's had a bit of a career. She sure has. Yeah. Absolutely has. Um, And I also, I really identified with this story just because like I sometimes wish that I was an old lady already so I could just dress how I want to dress. And yeah, like, it's so relatable. Were you thinking of that when you were directing this, like how it would inspire? Absolutely. Absolutely. Cause there were like moments like, and like little lines that we added in, like that Amy Hill line at the end was like an ad that I threw in. And I'm just like, it's the one that sticks with me the most where she's like, those years you want to skip, like those are the good years. Those are the you years. Because it is like we do like have this idea that we want to go back or we want to skip forward, but it's like, no, we're in this now and we're only going in one direction, you know? And once you get there, there is no going back and getting to do it again. Um, and and the person who we get to be then is only because of the person we are now and the lessons that we're learning now and the struggles that we're fighting through. And, um, and it's all part of it. But if you can let go of the stupid stuff, I think, like wanting to wear the right clothes and have the right hair and like all of like the 
the superficial stuff, like if you can let go of that and stop feeling constrained on those levels um, and really just like let your inner Rita shine, like that's the freedom, right? And if we could do that now, like what an amazing thing to like free our, our heads and hearts to focus on other things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you have any problems that arose when you were making this movie and, and how did you solve them? That's always a question. Uh, I mean, COVID. <laughs> COVID posed a bit of a problem. Uh, we were set, I, I came onto this project in January of 2020, which is the beginning of all great stories. <laughs> <laughs> are the big dreams of January 2020 and what we all thought was going to happen and then what didn't happen. And for me, that was like, remember when I was going to direct Diane Keaton in a movie because it felt like it just like completely went away. Our funding went away. We were supposed to shoot at Coachella, like the whole body, like the whole regression pod was in a tent, in a side tent of at Coachella. Oh. That went away. Uh and so it just didn't feel like it was going to happen. And then in October, Alex called and was like, I could get us some money, but we're going to have to like really scale the movie down, change these major set pieces and like rework group scenes. We couldn't have more than, you know, a certain number of people in a certain amount of space. And so there was just a lot of uh, juggling and 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 reworking and and we did it. And I really am like, I'm, I kind of love the script more now than what it was then, which is like, sometimes when the set pieces get too big, you get caught up in that and you sort of lose your characters and your story a little bit. So I loved sort of scaling it down the way we uh, needed to, but then also like putting this movie to like getting it together and getting it going, getting it capped. Like none of my actors met before their first day of shooting, there were no rehearsals. There were no chemistry reads. Like it was just a crapshoot of like me sitting down over Zoom like this and being like, I'm getting a vibe from this personality. I feel like, you know, I feel like Taylor Page and Diane could be really fun together. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think that Elizabeth and Dustin could have like cool chemistry, maybe. And so it really was, um, it was wild to get them all on set and watch it work. And I was just like, I thanked my lucky stars every night when I went home and I was, because it could have gone either way. I really do think so. I think um, that, that was wild. And then, you know, we had crazy like logistical things as we were shooting, like our day out at the beach, shooting the Marie Claire Power Summit, there was like an insane windstorm with like gale force winds that picked up our tents like it, we were in the Wizard of Oz and just like sent them down well, it was up to Malibu. <laughs> they went from like the Santa Monica Pier to Malibu. It wow. was crazy. It was really wild. Uh, so we had to go back and finish shooting that day. And the only day we could fit it in was the day that Diane is stepping out of the tanning bed. So it was like my two biggest moments <laughs> got crammed and truncated in on the same day, which was, that was crazy. <laughs> That's incredible. Also, speaking of the, the power summit scene, Nicole Byer. Nicole Byer and Jeffrey Self. Like that day was so wonderful. Watching those two little buggers of scene stealers, like they are so great. I love them so much. Nicole is just brilliant that that role is very you know minimal on the page like it was really me just knowing that whoever we were going to cast was going to be big and fill that space with something so unique to them and I was just like just do it like what do you think and she was like I got this and I was like great 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 and then Jeffrey Self comes in with uh, just his heart and his charm. And I just love him so much. I love him so much. They were incredible. I, I, was, so, I was so pleasantly surprised to see them. Um, uh, how long did you guys spend filming this? I want to say it was 28 days. I think we were four weeks. Okay, nice. Yeah. And I loved two more weeks. 
But I think it's really interesting to talk to directors about problem solving and like how you make the most of what you have. Yeah. Cool. Look, I, 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 I can't wait to see what it's like to work with a ridiculous budget that allows for time and, um, you know, all like that seems so foreign to me. All I know, like this movie was made on still a very tiny, small budget, but was so much bigger than like the two movies I had done before. My first movie I made for $10,000. So that's no money. The next movie was made for $250,000, $200,000. Um, so a movie of this size, which was made for under five is still like, I still felt like my playground just got like enormous and I had so much fun, but still we were having to exist within the constraints of, yeah. of time and budget. And, you know, I guess any filmmaker will say that there's never enough time and there's never enough money. And, and they're probably right because, you know, the more money you have, the bigger problems you have and the bigger sets you have and the bigger crews you have. And then, you know, it just all sort of snowballs. Yeah, I just think so much can be done too with just like the the color palette that you guys used was so bright and cheerful and like the sets yeah. that you had that beautiful house in Palm Springs. Where did you find that? That's in Pasadena. Really? Oh my Isn't gosh. Isn't that crazy? I know, I know. We got really, really lucky. Um, and I'm really glad because Palm Springs, the days we did shoot there were, it was so unbearably hot that we were all just like dying. Uh, and then our days shooting in Pasadena, we were in like wool sweaters. Wow. Oh I know. I know. I'm in Pasadena right now and it is so hot. I cannot imagine wearing a wool sweater. Well, it is August. We shot in March. Oh, so. nice. I'm it was so yeah. yeah. Well, I guess my last question for you would be, uh, now that we've talked about all the challenges and the great stuff that comes through that, what was the most rewarding part of making this movie for you? Um, I think looking at the final product and being really proud of it, I really like, I love how full my heart feels at the end of that final scene. Um, and I really hope that audiences, like I hope it fills their hearts too and leaves them with a sense of, of confidence that they can be who they are uh, unapologetically, love who that person is and uh, and, and go out into the world from there. I think the world is, is gnarly enough as it is, like we should be a little nicer to ourselves. Oh, that's perfect. That's a great, that's a great way to bookend this. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. And again, I just really, really enjoyed this movie. It was so uh, fun. It made me laugh. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.